to share. Uh, to share, uh, we are talking about mental health. And again, uh, well, you may have noticed that yesterday was Mental Health Awareness Day worldwide. And so uh, we're timely with this conversation. Um, but we also know that uh, through the last few years that uh, the focus on mental health has risen for all of us in so many ways. And again, not just for our kids, but for us. As therapists, we, you have a you have training and it's in your scope of practice to uh, to be part of the conversations. And that's really what it is. You do not have to be the lone ranger in any of these um, these uh, these conversations uh, about such uh, delicate topics. So um, you were at the table. What we do as professional is provide professional development. And today we welcome Amy Rose to share with um, with us their perspective, the perspective of social work and mental wellness in the school and help us to consider how we can partner and work together. Uh, all of our voices are needed at this table. So Amy Rose, I welcome you. Thank you for being here. What I'm seeing is your slides. Uh, they are not in presentation mode. Um, so I don't know if that's, uh, you wanna change your view on that but I'm just going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to you and uh, share with us how we can partner. Thanks so much, Deb. Um, they're not in presentation mode as in they look correct or incorrect? They they uh, show your slide set off to the left. They do not show, they do not have the full screen of your slide. Okay, give me just a second, I'll wiggle things around. Um, thanks so much for having me here today. I'm so excited. Um, to be able to spend some time with everybody talking about something that I'm very passionate about. Um, and um, sorry, I'm multitasking and not super good at that this morning. Um, let me try this and see. I think if you go to display settings and you swap screens, you probably will get it. Um, as Deb mentioned, I recently made a little bit of a shift in life, um, and that means that I have new um, magical screens and things, screens and things, so I appreciate your patience. Um, oops, I can give it a video. Um, you said to go to where, where Deb? I think it's at the top where you say, see display settings, and there should be a drop down there at the very top of your screen. You'll see show cast bar, display settings, and then slideshow. You see it, it says display settings and then it's got a drop down. If you click on that drop down, it should add it, you should be able to swap screens. Almost got it, guys. So sorry. No, it's quite all right. You were focused in a different direction. <laughs> uh, so while you're doing that, we'll just say the technology prayer. Please work. Amen. <laughs> no, no. Um, display settings in the middle above your main above your between slide. show taskbar and end slide at the top um, yeah up there right here wait sorry one more time at the top of your main slide in the middle uh -huh. and maybe you're not seeing the same thing that we are I don't think so. Be, I might. Okay. Probably wait. not. I had to just. There, right there, there yeah. it is. That's oh. it. Woo. Swap presenter view and slideshow. That was more difficult than it should have been. Why okay. is that way sometimes? I don't think it did anything. That didn't appear to, to work. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop share. I'm going to try to redo it real quick. I'm so sorry, everybody. I swear this is working. No, we all know how it feels. Uh -huh. you got we it. Go. Okay. Okay. Deep breath. Beautiful. Let's go. Okay. Right. So, um, 
My name is Amy Rose, and as Deb mentioned, um, I've spent most of my career either doing direct trauma therapy, um, and then I kind of moved around a bit into like a more macro level, um, looking at how we might be able to make a bigger impact through um, policy and programmatic change. Um, I currently recently switched over to a job at Peace Health, um, where I work with a program called Courageous Kids. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit. I'm going to make a small plug about that later, so hang in there for that. Um, so the first thing I'm going to say is please take care of yourself um, for the next 45 minutes or so. We're going to touch on some topics. I'm going to provide some data um, around things like child abuse and um, suicide and just some, some things that I know that we're all familiar with, but um, it's also just early in the morning. And um, so I just always encourage people that when we're talking about big and difficult things, um, just do what you need to do to take care of yourself. If you need to get up, walk around, or even just take a little break. If something comes up for you that's difficult, please feel free to reach out in the chat to Deb. Um, Chandra or myself, um, if you might just need a little extra support. I know I'm talking <clears throat> to a bunch of professionals, um, but even professionals need that as well. So, um, so first things first, um, the question I think we've all been asked or ask ourselves is can we blame everything on COVID? We know that um, behavioral health in students is just on the rise. Things are getting um, more acute. Um, we know that kids are experiencing higher ACEs throughout um, the state of Oregon, but also nationally. Um, and that there are some kind of global delays that are presenting at higher rates. And there's just this kind of like, why? Like, why are things looking more um, different and acute than they have been in years past? I don't know that I have the exact answer for that. So, um, I, I think it can play, it plays a part. It may not be the whole of it. Um, I pulled some recent data um, from the school wellness survey. So it was done in 2020, it was done again at the end of 2022. And so that data should be coming out soon. Um, you can look it up by county. So you can look specifically to the county that you reside in. And I'll, um, I'll send the link to Deb at where you can dig around in that if it's something that's interesting to you. Um, so this specifically is for Lane County. And if you look at 2020 for this county versus the state, um, you can, which it's interesting just to see state averages. Though, if you look at things um, like if you have you ever lived with someone who had um, a drinking problem or substance use in the house, um, the state averages for sixth grade about 18, eighth grade 25, 11th grade 32. Um, have you ever experienced a death of a very close friend or family member? Um, the averages stay right around 60% for all of our youth, which is incredibly high. Um, and then looking at things like, have you ever felt that you had no one to protect you? Again, you're going to be in the about 20 to 25 range. Um, so about a quarter of our kids have had this feeling mixed with loss, uh, mixed with substance use in the house. So if you start to think about what's going on for these kids, um, which I think, again, a lot of you know, it's just, it's a lot. Um, you can also go back in time in this survey. So if you look at like around 2015, um, still significant, but these, uh, these data points are uh, a lot less. So they're consistently on the rise every two years, um, 2020 being the highest that we've ever seen the ACEs data throughout the state. Um, this information I have below looks at childhood bereavement. Um, this uh, generation that we have right now of kids is the um, highest group of orphans that has ever existed ever in the world. Um, that has a lot to do with um, so many kids being raised by grandparents um, or familial caregivers. And then uh, uh, through COVID in the last few years, um, having lost so many people, um, it has just left so many kids with, uh, without family or living uh, in non-familial caregiver homes. And so this first graph shows from 2017 to 2021, that's the increase in, um, in youth who have had parents pass away. And this graph breaks down how those 
um, parents are being lost. So 21% to accidental overdose, 12% to COVID, 7 to 7% suicide, and 4% to um, homicide and gunshot. And this is all uh, organ data. And so when you kind of smash all of this together, it gives you kind of a pretty good idea of why we might be seeing increased um, behavior and difficulty and even some kind of delays in our students. Um, because when you have all of this going on, uh, life starts to feel and look pretty difficult. Um, um, and so, um, I, I actually did some digging into the code of ethics for PTs, OTs, um, SLPs. Um, I've, I've worked with all of you my whole career, but, uh, and I've always had such tremendous support from uh, all of these professions. Um, this little graph might be something that you all have seen or felt familiar with. Um, essentially the overlap that I kept hearing or seeing was collaboration and referral. Um, there's very few points in time where um, there was a direct ask that any um, OD or PT or SLP is doing direct uh, like mental health or therapeutic work. But what we know is that um, kids are showing up often in your spaces because of, of behavior and because of um, a need. Uh, they're experiencing a bait. A uh, barrier to participate in therapeutic work. Um, so, what we also know is that oftentimes, that when youth are working with OTs or PTs or SLPs, it allows them to be able to get the skills needed to make important disclosures or to to get to more services. Um, this is seen in other. Uh, fields as well. Um, I've worked in, I've been a medical social worker a lot, and one of the most um, common fields to diagnose uh, neurological disorders are eye doctors. It's not the job of an eye doctor to diagnose neurological disorders um, or even depression and anxiety, uh, but when someone stares into your eyes, they start to learn a lot about what might be going on with you. Um, and so, it's interesting that eye doctors are able to, to diagnose or refer, they're not diagnosing, they're referring out um, to people, but they're able to see or understand so much by just, just looking at people and having that prolonged eye contact. And I'm sure that there are other things that they can see in there that I don't have a lot of understanding of, um, but I think that that's also true um, when um, physical therapists OTs, SLPs come into play. You're picking up on things that I myself as a behavioral health clinician or somebody else just wouldn't have that extra layer of knowledge to think, oh, that is likely because of this um, and then make a referral to a proper place. Um, and, and we also understand that you can't do productive work with a kid who doesn't have like their frontal lobe intact, they're constantly in crisis. They're not able to take in new information. Um, they're hungry, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, right? Like I can't send a kid out to an SLP um, with a snack because he's hungry. It means you're not gonna get a lot of work done around mouth sounds if he's full of chips. Um, so it's working together as a team to figure out how do we get these essential needs met for youth? Um, we're working together. How do we get them regulated as best we can to onboard other skills? And then whatever all the whole team is learning is getting communicated back to everyone else involved. Also, it's very difficult for us as humans. Um, before a lot of you jumped on, we were talking about the whole human. Um, it's difficult for us to do this if we aren't in touch with ourselves as whole humans. Uh, a service I offered while working at the Douglas County ESD was reflective supervision. Um, and I'd quite frequently get uh, professionals, whether it was teachers, superintendents, nurses that would come to me and say, I'm really struggling to be uh, mindful in my practice while working with students right now because their, their trauma is so activating to my own trauma. And I'm trying to work with this kid and I'm trying to be present with them. 
Um, but it's hard when they're making disclosures about the trauma that's happening in their home, or I just know about it, or, you know, whatever it is. And that's extremely real. Like we all have shown up to this work for a reason. Um, and we all have lives outside of this work. Many of us have kids and it can be very difficult to kind of put that away and be very present in the moment. And I just want to give that voice that it's, it's just not an easy thing to always do. Sometimes it is, but sometimes you get that one kid where you're just like, just going to take them home. And we're not allowed to do that. Um, or the opposite where you're like, I can't, I can't, this kid triggers me for whatever reason. It's just difficult for me right now. Um, so, so then what is the role? Like, what is the best way? How can we best help? Um, my policy brain always says the best thing to do is to know the policy of where you work, whether that is school-based or clinic-based. Um, the more that we can know about policy, the more that we can best support the youth in the way that's going to be productive. So around making mandated reports, know the policy of where you work, of course, you're going to do it if it needs to be done. Um, what if the youth reports abuse is imminent upon returning home? Um, of course, check in with the people where you work, um, but there's always the option to call law enforcement. What if the youth reports abuse, um, but no DHS case is assigned? Um, that's a hard one. And um, if you feel comfortable giving like a little thumbs up emoji or some kind of emoji, if you've been in that situation where you knew something was going on in the home that you called um, and there was no case assigned and you're, you're continuing to work with a kid who's continuing to, to say that they're experiencing some kind of abuse. We know that that is extremely difficult um, and the best advice is to just continue to make reports any time a disclosure is made or any time there's a clear concern. Um, managing actively suicidal youth or youth with thoughts of suicide. Again, I'm going to defer back to knowing the exact policy for the school. So um, in the state of Oregon, every school has to have a policy around what to do if a youth has thoughts or um, a plan around suicide, and that's called the Addies Act. Um, and so if you are school-based, um, it's probably a great idea to kind of ask your school for a copy of their Addies Act plan because it, what it will include is also a flow chart that kind of depicts, and I have a visual brain, um, as well as a, a very outlined policy of if the youth is to make a statement um, around suicidal ideation or a plan, who's the first point of contact, and then um, kind of like line by line, what's to happen after that. Um, quite often these plans or maybe shared among administration, but they don't always trickle down, especially to contractors or people who are like coming on site for a bit and leaving. Um, though oftentimes it's those people that disclosures might be made to. Um, so it's a great thing to get in touch with the people at the school to say, you know, what, what training do you give your staff around this? How can I participate in that training if that's something you desire to do? But mostly, like, what is your what is your standard practice and policy around this, so that you know how to best protect yourself in that moment and how to care for that kid. Um, same kind of around like dual relationships. Um, I know Oregon has lots of um, lots of urban areas, but also lots of rural areas, which puts a lot of professionals. Uh, being like the one person to cover a, um, a district or large parts of a county. And if that's the case, that can put you in a position where you're, um, you're working with uh, kids of people that you know, um, which is okay. But then when it becomes complicated around behavior, um, or that kid is saying, making disclosures about concerns with the parents, and then you have relationship and or know those parents, or they're your neighbor, they live down the street. Um, it's great to, to have a good understanding about how those dual relationships can be managed. Um, and again, I lean heavy on the administration, lean heavy on your supervisor, lean heavy on somebody who's going to help to protect you and make sure that you feel safe and comfortable in managing those dual relationships because they can feel pretty complicated. 
Um, so always look for what policy is in place, um, also around information sharing. Um, quite often I'll hear from uh, contractors or people, again, who are covering like lots of big areas that are not really being kept in the loop. So maybe um, there's a group of people that are working with a, a particular individual. They're really aware of the youth's trauma history and things um, that we know can affect their um, their speech and their um, sensory seeking or defensiveness, all of this stuff they're feeding, um, but that information doesn't always get translated over. And it can be a great idea just off the bat to ask, uh, how can you access that information? What information might not even be written down anywhere, but is common knowledge to the rest of the team? Um, and how can you assure that you're being kept in the loop um, and consequently being able to get information back? to others. Okay. Any questions so far? I feel like I'm talking really fast. I don't see anything in the chat box, but if you do have questions, please type them in the chat box or unmute yourself as you go along. Uh, this may be things that you haven't considered before, so it may take reflection to know what your questions are, but feel free at any time to jump in. It's totally fine. I'll, I have no problem keeping talking, but I just want to make sure I'm not going too fast. Um, so when working with kids that might have, um, like a diagnosis such as ADD, ADHD, um, you know, any kind of neurodivergence, uh, really kind of anything at all that is outside of, uh, typical, uh, these youth are at such a increased risk for abuse or neglect. Um, I had some data pulled on it, but I don't think I put it in here. So, um, it's extremely likely that if you're interfacing with youth, these are youth that are likely at an increased risk um, for some kind of abuse or neglect. Um, and I say that because it's just great to kind of keep your eyes and ears a little bit open. And this is this is also kind of, I think, where some of that interplay comes in for just like checking for behavioral and mental health. Um, nearly uh, two thirds of cases handled in the state around abuse and neglect um, were um, child sexual abuse, um, which is one of the primary forms of abuse that occur around kids with any kind of mental health diagnosis. And 77% 70 per, um, of those cases, the offenders were parents, um, which is really the key of where um, having that one safe adult comes in. And if kids are working with you, especially around speech skills or articulation skills, really just around anything, um, but feeling like there's one-to-one -one time, relationship, rapport, it is significantly not unlikely that they would feel safe to make a disclosure. And that can feel scary. It can feel like a lot of things, um, but it's such an honor that a kid would feel like you're a safe person that they can talk to about this. Um, recently, I looked at some of the statistics, and obviously I love statistics, um, but two thirds of disclosures around abuse and neglect occur in a school setting, um, whether that's teachers, administrators, um, a high amount of um, library and janitor staff, um, but it's really all of you that kids are going to feel safe to say, like, something's going on at home. Something's not right. Um, and oftentimes it may come out, like it may just come out, um, but oftentimes they may need a prompt, um, which could be something as simple as, hey, how are things going at home? Hey, are you feeling safe at home? Um, what's your relationship like with your parents? And it can be just simple little, um, we, we wouldn't, uh, want to do something too leading, um, but just little questions that are like a touch base. Uh, and sometimes you can do that at like the beginning of each session. Hey, how, how are things going at home? Um, that's enough for them to know that you're open to having that conversation because you're interested again in their whole self. You're interested in, um, in whatever service you're providing to them, how they're doing at school, but also like how are things going at home? whether that is, are they practicing at home? Is it somebody helping them with the skills that, they, that you're teaching them at home? 
but just like also in general, like how are things? And it doesn't have to turn into like a 40 minute conversation every time. You can let them know it's just going to be a quick check in, um, but it lets them know that somebody is very invested. And that's when these things start to come out. Um, so kind of just being that, again, that one safe adult helping to teach those coping skills or um, work towards tools towards coping. Um, look for signs of abuse or neglect uh, and or mental health concerns, which doesn't necessarily mean that you're the person to, to fix it all, but maybe to be the person to make referrals. Um, so making those appropriate referrals, assuring just immediate safety and creating a safe environment for that disclosure to occur if it, if it needs to. Um, I'm going to touch on this one last part about um, suicide and self-harm. So um, suicide is the second leading cause of death for our young kids, um, 10 to 24. Um, the leading cause is accidental injury, um, though it is suspected that many accidental injuries is um, likely could have crossed over into suicide. There still needs to be a little bit more done on that. Um, and one in five contemplate suicide um, and having a mental health issue really increases that. Um, there's other things that increase it. I could talk about this. Um, for a long time, but I won't. Um, if you're ever concerned about suicide um, or self-harm with youth, I just really encourage you to ask the question. Um, it can feel scary to ask the question. Um, so I encourage people to just take whatever is concerning you and reflect it back to them. So if it's particular language, like if kids are saying um, they don't really care anymore and they um, just aren't interested, like in being around or um, or if it's like a behavior change, like behavior cues, you can say, hey, you know, sometimes when kids say they just don't care about life anymore and they don't really want to be here, um, sometimes they're thinking about suicide and I wonder if that's true for you um, because then it's hard for them to become defensive because you've taken just the information that they've given to you and reflected it back. Um, I typically ask the question to youth and my coworkers and anyone I'm concerned about probably three to five times a week. I've never had anyone get upset with me, um, but I know it's a fear that people have. Like, what if they're not thinking about it? Am I going to put the idea in their head? Are they going to get mad at me? Research shows um, you're not going to put the idea in their head. Either it's there or it's not. And if it's there, again, like abuse or neglect, they're probably waiting for someone to ask to give them space and time to be able to talk about it. Generally, if somebody is thinking about it, you'll see their shoulders like physically drop, like a whole body change of like, okay. And then they'll be able to let you know what's going on for them. Whether it's like, yeah, I've kind of thought about it, but I don't really think I'm going to do it. Or yeah, and I have a plan in which case you defer back to that Addie's Act plan or your agency policy and get that ball moving. Um, I also always warn people that you're going to get that answer to the question of what you ask, which I learned early in my career. Um, I started off my career as a therapist at a children's farm home, um, the, the state hospital for kids. And I was working with a kid and I just thought, um, oh, I'm getting so many signs lots of verbal cues, lots of physical cues. And I asked the kid if he was thinking about hurting himself. And he said, no, um, no. I said, okay. And he kept talking and my gut, my body, everything said, oh no, no this isn't great. I'm really worried. Um, and so I said, I have to stop you again. I know that I just asked you, if you were thinking about hurting yourself, but you know, you've said this and this, I'm wondering if you're thinking about suicide. And he said, yeah, yeah. Duh. And I was like, but you just said, he said, I said, I wasn't thinking about hurting myself because it's not going to hurt. Um, and I said, okay, okay. Um, and we started talking safety planning. I pulled in some other people to support me. Um, but I realized that day that um, if you want to ask about self-harm, because that's your concern, completely appropriate. But if your concern is really about somebody taking their life, it's important to get those words in there. It's important to get the words suicide in there. Um, 
because I asked him about self-harm and that really wasn't on his radar. He made it clear to me that within his plan, he, he wouldn't feel too much. Um, clear is kind. Um, it's, it's can get easy to kind of get in our, in our own nerves and beat around the bush a little bit, but trying to be as clear as possible is going to be best in that moment. And um, also just acknowledging, again, you might not always be the right person. Um, maybe you've had a recent loss in your life. Um, maybe, uh, you know, maybe a lot of things. And so if you're really worried about a student, but you're not in a place where you feel comfortable or ready or prepared to either ask the question or to receive what answer may come, um, that's okay. Just find someone who is. Maybe it's a, um, you know, somebody down the hall or, or whoever it is. Just make sure you keep that kid safe until you get to the right person who can, who can ask those questions. Because it doesn't always have to be you. And maybe sometimes it can be you. And maybe it's just not the right day. You know, there's a lot of reasons, um, and that's totally. Okay, it's completely appropriate um, because we, if we don't take care of ourselves, we can't take care of other people. And you always have to prioritize making sure that you're in good space. Um, okay, I'm gonna go back for a minute and see if anyone has questions. Um, and then we can talk a little bit about a case study. As people are reflecting on, on what we just talked about, uh, we had this a session scheduled originally for uh, December in thinking about uh, the holidays are a time when some a lot of people are joyous, but sometimes they are that is what triggers uh, some of the emotions and um, uh, that underlie it all. And so uh, moving it here, I feel like it, these are tough conversations. And yes, therapists have mental uh, awareness and mental health as part of their training. Um, I, I I think having bringing these statistics up really tell us why we all need to be uh, having these conversations. Um, these kids are in our classrooms and in our in your therapy sessions, and we're not trying to de determine or debate your role because that's going to be different uh, where depending on where you are employed and your district. And again, going back to what Amy Rose said, always go back to your district to make sure you know what the plan is so that you're not going outside of that. And of course, always relying on your licensure to make sure you're in tune. But what we're really talking about is an awareness of these things and, and what could be happening because it's quite likely you will be a person who hears it. If we don't talk about it, then what do you do? Well, it is scary to be that person, but having some uh, common conversation and some common knowledge helps us to know that we uh, we don't have to be the Lone Ranger, um, but it helps us to know how to react when these things um, are, are in our world. Does that make sense? I hope so. If you have questions or comments, um, we're seeing these kids uh, in our classrooms and uh, obviously it was happening before COVID. The spotlight is shining on it now. Um, what questions do you have? What are you seeing in your sessions? Some alarming statistics that could apply to us kids. And I in, inevitably there's someone sitting there saying, this is applying in my home life as well. And so again, having these conversations, we will not, uh, it, it, you can still ask questions um, as you process this information. Amy Rose, let's go ahead and talk about uh, application to a particular um, unidentified student or de-identified. Um, I'm gonna do my quick plug for Courageous. Please do. Um, and I'll be super transparent. I actually took a step back from a director position to manage this program because I myself got custody of a young kid um, experiencing all of the things that we just talked about. Um, and she's an absolute joy. And I am so lucky to have her in my life. But um, as Deborah mentioned, this uh, applies to us 
um, personally, many of us as it does professionally, whether it's our own kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, neighbors. Um, uh, Courageous Kids is such an amazing uh, program. Uh, it went virtual during COVID and kind of dissipated. Um, and so I'm uh, working right now to really build it back up. Um, and it uh, offers grief support to youth who have lost family members, whether that is siblings, parents, um, grandparents, um, step parents. And um, they, we are doing school groups. Um, we do groups with kids um, as well as caregivers at the same time. But it's a huge component is a summer camp. Um, this year's summer camp will be in July. Um, we serve kids from all over the state um, of that Sky Camp um, uh, at Fall Creek. Um, so if anyone has interest in participating in an amazing summer camp experience, it's um, three nights, um, four days, and we serve um, elementary through high school students. Um, it wouldn't have to be in your designation as a professional. You can come play in the music tent or in the sewing tent or, um, you know, do some happy, it sounds like a sad thing, but it is one of the most joyous experience for these kids to just be allowed to be um, having fun. And it brings together kids with such a shared life experience that they um, realize that they are not alone in the things that they've experienced and they're just able to play and have fun and be with kids um, who have this, again, shared life experience um, and just it gives them a little break from life to just uh, and we just do a lot to spoil them. Um, so if you feel like playing in the mountains, I have my email on here. It'll be on the slides feel free to reach out and I'm happy to tell you about the different roles and positions, um, all of which are a lot of fun. And we provide just a half day of training once you get up there um, around, um, you know, just some basic safety stuff. Um, but really a, a pretty neat experience to be able to support kids in this way. Um, so keep it on your mind if you know someone that might be interested or a youth that might benefit um, from having this experience, uh, feel free to refer them my way. We'll see if we can't get them um, some support and um, have, get them doing something fun. The question came in the chat, Amy Rose, is this yeah. program just for Oregon? Um, this, is, this is for Oregon. If you live somewhere else, um, also feel free to reach out to me because we kind of have a coalition of camps. Um, so I'm familiar with ones in other regions um, and I'd be happy to connect you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so this case study um, is taking place actually in a residential setting that I used to work at, but has a school on site. Um, so this youth was brought into a residential setting after an inability to regulate in school or in a foster setting. The youth kept getting out of their seat, wandering around the classroom. They often failed to finish their work and their writing was largely ineligible. Illegible. The teacher notes that the youth seems to struggle with fine motor skills, uh, such as holding and writing with a pencil and eating um, food, though notices advanced motor skills with things such as playing games. Uh, the youth is often found speaking quickly in full sentences with peers around preferred topics, though when called on in class, the youth struggles to articulate and takes long, awkward pauses in forming words or sentences. Perhaps most distressing, whenever line staff would lower the lights at night, the youth would immediately pull the fire alarm, resulting in a full evacuation of a lockdown unit of youth, which is not fun. Um, this happened over a week. Despite intervention involving nightlights, talk therapy, um, really when this would happen, the youth would really shut down and wouldn't talk at all, um, really for the rest of the evening. And whenever anyone would say like, hey, why'd you do that? What's going on? Nothing. Um, the suspicion was that it could be sensory related. Um, the youth was 10 years old. Um, I don't know why that says with attention. Um, there was, a, I think there was suspicion of uh, uh, ADD, but um, unknown. Focus um, and attitude challenges. There have been unknown changes in the home that resulted in the youth being placed in foster care, though the caseworker was new and unable to provide 
much to any historical information on the environmental or medical history. She was working on gathering some files, but at the time the youth came to us, we really had no known medical, like mental health diagnostics, medical diagnostics. So as a team, we were trying to figure out like, like what's going on. The youth has known um, okay, so that's what that says. They weren't taking any medication. The removal from foster placement was due to um, uh, difficult transitions at night, night tears and running away and like hiding behavior. So they weren't like running away to like escape the foster home, but at night, often they would run away and like hide places, like hide in the bushes or um, you know, they'd find a little hole and they tuck themselves in and hide. And the foster placement was like, we can't do this, um, which is when they ended up getting transitioned to the residential placement. I mean, they were only in the foster placement for two or three days. So um, the teacher, the line staff asked that these be assessed by PT, OT, SLP, um, as well as the LCSW um, due to the kind of speech concerns concerns around the fine and gross motor movement, eating, and ability to sit, as well as sensory issues involving light, and um, just as trying to make a plan that would involve not having to evacuate the lockdown unit of high acuity behavior kids every night, um, and try to figure out like what is going on with this kid. Um, there was a lot of theories around like oppositional defiant. There was theories around um, well, I'll hold off on the theories and let you all create some theories. Does this sound like a student that any of you have worked with before? It's no surprise to us then that left without um, without addressing these things, the behaviors would come out of that. He doesn't know how to deal with his own emotions and then behavior. So what was the comment that, if you'd like to unmute yourself, please feel free to expound on this and about trauma that's occurring at night. Is there anything that you would like to add or expound on there? Feel free to unmute yourself. get it. Technology. We forgot to say the prayer for you. Her microphone isn't working. But things that are happening at night. Like you said, he, he's not trying to run away and leave what could be a safe place. He's just trying to put himself into a tight, closed space is what it sounds like. It kind of adds to the sensory piece. I was wondering the same thing if abuse had been occurring at night, either sexual or physical. And so that's why nighttime and having lights turned out might be a trigger. Good thought. I have to protect myself from what's going to happen when the lights go up. And then, I wonder <clears throat> what communication ahead. supports we could offer. I wonder what communication supports could be offered to um, support whatever language delays might be getting in the way of him sharing what's happening for him if he's not got the language to tell you um, why it's a trouble, why this time is happening, why am I um, experiencing this, why am I needing to protect myself in these ways that you don't understand, then um, maybe what, what kind of communication supports could we come in with that would give an opportunity to share? Ashley, are you an SLP? I'm not. I'm an early childhood special education specialist. Well, I love that you're thinking on that because if we don't have the communication and we can't share our thoughts, uh, that's a good place to start. Great perspective. Also, like, Go ahead. hi, Ashley. <laughs> Say again. Hi. I was just saying hi to Ashley. I just oh. adore her and I didn't know she was here, so... <laughs> more comments um has anyone asked the child what's going on you know all of the professionals may be talking amongst themselves but who has asked that child that tough question and it goes back to even if we asked, 
does he have the tools to be able to tell us? Great comments. What would you do? And Anna says, I wonder if the birth family had was homeless before nighttime, um, because that can be quite uh, terrifying if you don't know where you're going to be. And as Chandra says, a lot of these symptoms can be induced by neglect. Jean, would you like to add? This tells me we should ask the children why. Often we think we have the whys. It's true. Anything else you'd like to add about that, Jean? And certainly, Joy, what you're saying here, that it's possible that he was left alone at night. And if someone's left alone while somebody goes out, maybe they said, lock yourself in, don't let anybody in. And so now when you're in a new setting, how am I going to lock myself in? All the things, and we don't know what's going through their minds. But I love that they came back to the therapist for their, for their support. Siblings, would you like to expound on that question? So does this student have siblings? Are they going through similar things? Is it possible that the sibling could be part of the ongoing problem? Okay. Do they have any older siblings was the question. Yeah, we we weren't unaware, but that was that's a great question. Yeah, these are all great questions. Mm -hmm. I love the way your minds are going. Yes. All right, Deb, I think we should get to the... We could have simple people. visuals to ask the why. Would there be appropriate child age visuals to ask that? Hmm. And then what is the basis of that emotional response? Okay. Comprehensive evaluation. So people are taking what you've got, but they certainly want more. And I think that's where we all should come from is I don't have enough. And information and what I have, maybe we need to dig a little deeper. And so we have until, we still got another 20 minutes. Uh, so we can certainly entertain additional questions. I think Since all of the questions go ahead. everyone is asking are so spot on. Um, part of the problem, which I'm sure all of you have come across is when you get a kid in, in the foster care system and they're just so little information provided. Um, also something I've a theme I've heard is um, just at, just having that time with the youth to ask those questions um, and providing visual tools. Um, also just miraculously spot on. That's actually how we got to the answer. Um, also, I just want to um, clap and work with all of you um, because all of these kind of solutions are so um, magically trauma-informed and just amazing, uh, especially with a, a youth like this who, um, even if you don't know what's going on, it's, um, I think for most of us, we know something has happened to lead to this behavior. It leads in my brain to that will versus skill conversation. Like it's very likely he isn't just doing this um, to be a jerk. That would be weird. Nobody gets up in the morning and thinks like, I'm going to see how many people I want to upset today. And if they are, why? Like there's still a why behind it. Um, and if we can get to the why, then we can figure out what's going on for this youth. I think that um, 
oftentimes within systems, whether it's school systems or structural systems, it's also easy for people to just get frustrated, especially if it makes a big commotion, especially if you're standing in the cold rain with 30 kids who are screaming, <laughs> then your people are like, just make him not do that anymore. Like you can't do that. Um, and so it's getting to that contextual information of why he's doing that, that allows people to have an understanding and sympathy and empathy to create the appropriate interventions. Um, and so helping, especially like line staff and people who are just doing the day, not just doing the day to day, because that's essential and crucial and such important work, but providing them with the information and knowledge of this is why this person is acting this way, allows them to take those deep breaths and be like, okay, none of us want to be out here evacuating every night in the rain. And we have to keep attempting to figure out what happened for this youth that, that all of these things keep happening. Um, so everything that you all said was perfect. I can tell you that um, what I was going to say before, which was that there's a, a lot of theories around like oppositional defiant disorder, which like doesn't even make sense. It would be a weird thing to only be defiant between like seven and nine o'clock at night, but the rest of the time be fine. So um, I was pretty quickly attempting to rule that one out. But we know that sometimes when kids do things that are like not cute and we don't like, that's a diagnosis that people can lean into to be like, oh, they're being defiant. Um, but still, I always want to know like, why? Why are they being defiant? There's usually a reason that kids show up in that space of defiance, so whether it's trauma, even neurodivergence can look like defiance because they're really concrete. So like, let's keep digging when we get to that that acronym. Um, and, um, and, you know, maybe he is afraid of the dark, but we tried um, so many interventions around, particularly around that. So um, every, every single thing that you all have mentioned was so spot on and accurate to what needed to happen for this particular youth so that he uh, could feel safe and successful. Any other last minute guesses before I give you all the, the answer. What would you do with this youth? Lots of great comments already. I'm dying to know how it turned out. <laughs> all right. time for my computer to act up. Now you're all on the edge of your seats. Okay, we'll get one more guess in before I switch screens. There's a question, can you give examples of the visuals? I'm not sure if that was a question of the person who was talking about visuals earlier. What would you do in helping them? Maybe their symbols. Um, anybody have any thoughts on what visual supports might look like? And so I'm not sure if it's visual supports to give them the opportunity to express themselves or to be able to work through situations with prompts and choices. I guess all of that, all that together. Visuals to disclose the why. Thank you, Jean, for saying that. You're right yeah. about that too. Not It, it zaps your energy. Uh, when you go back to you talking about Maslow, if you don't feel safe in your environment, you're really not moving to any higher level activities. Core communication board. Okay, drum roll. Okay, so um, this particular youth had vestibular processing challenges, meaning that they needed more movement. Um, the foster family and school were constantly reprimanding him for behavior, which he had little control over. The big thing, which is um, uh, there was also um, exposure to drugs in utero. Um, the youth was diagnosed um, 
and scheduled for therapy. Um, he was also scheduled to be tested for ADHD slash ASD. Um, the youth was found to have weak core muscles and poor bone density, likely due to neglect, which someone mentioned, with multiple past untreated fractures. Uh, the youth was um, supported by a comprehensive team. Um, okay, so the, re the nighttime thing. Uh, the youth was removed from his house by the SWAT team. Um, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with a SWAT removal, but the first thing that they do um, is flip the breaker. Um, and they, and so the house goes dark. So every time the lights would go dim, he would think that the SWAT team was coming in and they came in through his roof. Um, and so he was concerned every time that the lights would go dim, that people were gonna come in through the roof to get him and take him away somewhere unknown to him, whether that was to a home with strangers or to this, honestly, lockdown facility, which feels a little scary. Um, and so he'd just become terrified to the point of running, hiding, not being able to articulate. Um, it was just a really intense trauma response. But without having that knowledge of the SWAT removal, um, we had no idea, uh, I mean, I suspected some kind of trauma response and people um, suggested some things about sexual trauma, which is where my brain went. Um, but once we had that information to know that that's what occurred, um, which he was able to kind of talk to us about, um, he actually drew a picture of um, men coming in through the ceiling on like wires, like on little ropes. Um, and then we were able to start piecing things together and maybe a day or two later got some of the files. Um, and then we were able to create a plan for him around um, how to support him through nighttime transitions in lights um, and also do some therapeutic work around, around what had occurred for him. Um, but once you have that little piece of information, everything makes so much sense. But without it, you have a multidisciplinary team with eight different theories about what's happening for this youth, none of which are truly based in reality. They're just conceptual. And all of those theories have different modalities of action that would say, oh, do this, do this, do this. None of which were really going to get to the root cause of what was going on for this particular kid. Um, so this is just one example of how, um, and this, uh, was ultimately sussed out by an SLP um, who did some amazing work with the youth around uh, visuals and art um, and was able to, to get that information back to us. So um, we leaned heavy on everybody. Uh, it was an SLP that cracked the case uh, in accordance with um, just an amazing group of people. So you never, never know exactly. Um, what little piece of information you're missing or who's who on that team is gonna be able to fill in that gap. Um, so though it's never the, the job of any single individual to know it all or do it all, um, oftentimes it's all of everyone working together to piece out those little things so that we can figure out what's going on for you and help them be productive. And I can say that by the time, um, maybe about six months in, this youth was um, being just really, really productive and articulating well and um, actually physically growing well once he was able to get proper nutrition um, and transition into a foster home that was a, a great fit for him. So it has a happy ending. Um, and I appreciate everyone's kind of leaning in and brainstorming all of the um, things that it could have done because they're, they were all and and I and what you right. said keeps sticking with me that so many people were probably writing it off as as a behavior and trying to extinguish that without really getting underneath of it and it just um, it it just was a beautiful selection for a case study because it showed how uh, how success can happen when you all come together. Uh, Jean's Jean's asking as a PT, the school counselors often say they can't share certain information. So, uh, and she's wondering how that works uh, with collaboration. 
Yeah, I've run into that a lot too. At a minimum, they should be able to share like a 504 in their IEP if that is something that's available, um, which should have at a minimum like the diagnosis. But um, depending on the credentialing of the school counselor, like if they are an LCSW, an MSW, an LPC, um, it's they, within their ethics, they're obligated to share information for continuity of care and for for good provided care actually lists out PT, SLP, OT, like that you're sharing information with those um, people to provide good care. Um, school counseling, it's like the school counselor degree is actually more uh, oriented towards uh, academics than counseling counseling. I'm not as familiar with their code of ethics, to be honest. Um, but if it's any kind of therapeutic license, like their therapy um, or counseling license, um, I would defer them back to their their code of ethics around um, continuity and, and shared care. Um, and also maybe looking again at the policy within the um, place where you work because I know that everyone wants to be like you know I'm gonna have I don't know maybe maybe an ROI might be needed but if you work within the same um, agency then that seems like probably not if you're a contractor maybe there might need but that's just a simple form that could be completed I'm sure the parent would want you to have access to that information to provide good care for the guardian or you know, whoever, whoever's in charge of that is. And Chandra points out that it's a lot of interpretation in a, co a code of ethics. And I think that's true with a lot of the, even the legislation in our uh, scope of practice that it's, people really want uh, black and white answers on this is what I'm supposed to be in this situation. And it's always, and it depends because we're talking about people and we're talking about licensure interpretation. We're talking about school policies, and uh, there's that the, there's so many factors that it's really hard to say A needs to B needs to C, and gives us a direct path. But we're rarely direct, um, but working together in collaboration as a team, we know, uh, is the best way to go. It brings all those perspectives into one conversation whose voice is missing from the table. Don't let it be yours because we know that you are trained here. We know that these are uh, the strategies and supports and best practice that you can bring. It doesn't mean that your role, your role becomes the uh, single support for mental health. Uh, when we consider all of the things that are on your plate, your expertise is needed. Um, it, it just helps us to be aware of all of these things so we know when to take action and when we know when to phone a friend uh, to make sure that we're bringing the supports. So additional comments, additional questions. Okay, so Chandra, if you would go ahead and stop the recording.